Ladies and gentlemen, um, I think this is the largest crowd I believe we've ever had in the forum, so we welcome all of you. Thank you. Uh, my name is David Pryor, and I'm director of the Institute of Politics. And I just want to say in behalf of the Kennedy School of Government and all of us here at the Institute, and also with Dr. with Professor Henry Lewis Gates, we all welcome you to the forum. Uh, if I might, at eight o'clock there is an announcement. At eight o'clock tonight, we're going to have a uh, we, we, we have a double header this evening. We have a discussion on the Supreme Court, how its makeup may or may not change after the election of tomorrow. Uh, our speaker is Jeff Rosen. He is with George Washington law school in washington dc and jeff is with new republic he is probably one of the foremost authorities on the united states supreme court as it relates to our political climate and the political spectrum we welcome each and every one of you to stay tonight and we're going to move right into our program because we're running just a little bit late on the eve of what could be the most important and closest election in american history we also tonight join in discussing one of America's most important issues. Tonight, the W.E.B. Du Bois Institute for African American Research and the Institute of Politics are honored to host here in the forum one of America's most acclaimed and talked about filmmakers, Spike Lee. I ask I asked several people today what they, just give me a one word on Spike Lee, their, their sort of feeling or definition about Spike Lee. Here are the three that I got most of. Talented, insightful, provocative. Joining us tonight is also a distinguished group of scholars and artists to discuss Mr. Lee's latest work, Bamboozled, and the always difficult discussion of race and the media. This forum, here at Harvard University in the Kennedy School of Government has always prided itself with that place where a freedom of discussion can take place and sometimes controversial issues are discussed. Ladies and gentlemen, we're about to see a three minute trailer on bamboozle. Lights go down, please. Thank you. Huxtables, Cosby, a genius, revolutionary, but we can't go down that road again. The network does not want to see Negroes on television unless they are buffoons. Have you ever thought about just quitting? I have a contract. The only way I get out of that is if I get fired, and that is what I intend to do. I know you are familiar with minstrel shows, variety shows, like in Living Color. Right, 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 that was dope. Man, tan. The new millennium minstrel show. We're gonna need a little more money for this. This could be bigger than Friends, Ally McBeal, even my boys Amos and Andy. Damn. You're putting white actors in black face. We're using black actors with blacker faces. This fall. Right on, man. Yeah, great show. You won't believe what's coming to your television. Sleep and Eat and Mantan are lazy and unemployed. Do your stuff. But we are certainly not saying anything about the entire African American community. What's sweeping the nation? And what's coloring? The way you see the world. Yo, we can't let this injustice go by, man. Not this time, man. You know what I'm saying? Nah, man. You know what I'm saying? You know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? Uh, we all act better, sound better. When are you gonna come into the light? The light. The light. Your hands are just as bloody as mine. Cousins, I want you all to go to your windows. We talking about revolution. Go to your windows and yell out. I am not gonna take it anymore! Hey, yeah. 
I don't want anything to do with anything black for at least a week. Uh, good evening, son. I'm a psychiatrist. I'm a psychiatrist at Harvard Medical School and a recovering minstrel. Uh, think about it. <laughs> I'm not going to give a long introduction to Spike Lee because all of you know who Spike Lee is. Spike, to the mic. Thank you. Hey, hold on a second. And I was about to say, you know, we still feel a mighty good now. Celebrate our 26th World Championship. The last, we're at the pace of money to Pat Riley because, you know, he had three Pete uh, patented. So that's three in a row. The last four out of five. And in Boston, here is 1918 since. Uh, <laughs> 1918. God damn. But where's the cameras at? You know, when the World Series come to get to put the patches on the hat? 98, 99, 2000. So uh, I just had to get that out of the way. Anytime I come to Boston, I always got to wear a Yankee hat. The, uh, we, uh, this film came out Friday. The Legend of Dagger Vance. And people want to ask me why I made Bamboozled. Like, we've made so many advances that why is there a need to go back? So here we have a film by an Academy Award winning director, Robert Redford, from a novel. And the film takes place in Georgia. Hang 'em high, Georgia. Like 1931. And the premise just bothered me, because if this character, Dag Dagger Vance, is supposed to be a saint or a spirit, or a god, if you're coming back to Georgia during depression, when black people being lynched and castrated left and right, why are you fucking with Matt trying to teach Matt Damon a golf swing? I don't. <laughs> of all the th black people catching hell left and right, and we all think that spirits are gods or just gods are spirits and righteous. Is this a priority? To teach this guy his golf swing and then to help him in his uh, Stanley? Why don't you take a seat? <laughs> <laughs> to teach him teach him a golf swing and then see if he's going to get together with Cherise Theron, whatever her name is. <laughs> and here we are in the year 2000, so 
And we go, we go back to the, the Green Mile before that. And then the best film of 1989, Drive Miss Daisy. So this, is, this stuff is not dormant. I mean, I, I think Michael Clark Duncan is a good actor, but the role he had, they're going to let him go. Then they'll open up, the, put the key in the cell, and you can walk. Well, Mr. Tom Hanks, I'm damn just, I just ready to die right here with you. I don't want to. The Patriot. Another guy, they said, look, you help us fight the British, the Nazi British, we'll, we'll set you free. So they defeat the British, it's time to go. No, I'm going to stay right here and help Mel Brooks build this house. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, go back to Donald Bogle's book. It's the, it's the happy slave. Given a chance for freedom. Working from can't see in the morning, can't see at night. Servitude, whip, tearing his back up, all types of stuff. Given a chance of freedom, he'd rather stay and help Mel Brooks. <laughs> help Mel Brooks build his house. <laughs> but you gotta miss the, you, you might miss the symbolism because the house is supposed to meant America because the whole movie had this this racist who's on this guy's ass. And then finally he says, you know what? It's been a pleasure to serve with you. So you have this racist and this slave together helping to build Mel Brooks' house. So I don't think none of the stuff we made up in Bamboozle. I don't think any of that stuff was made up. And a lot of things people got tricked up about was that, the whole blackface thing. In the year 2000, in the new millennium, you don't have to have, you don't have to wear blackface to be part of a minstrel show or to be. Or to, or to be a minstrel act. So that's all I have to say to we have to get on with the rest of this stuff. <laughs> Thank you. In about 25 minutes at 7 o'clock, we're going to break and open the floor to questions from people in the audience. So the panel has about 25 minutes. So I'm going to briefly introduce uh, uh, everyone on the panel, to my far left, Stanley Crouch, who's the... <laughs> you know him, but I'll plug his latest book, which is uh, Don't the Moon Look Lonesome, a novel in blues and swing. Uh, next to him, we have uh, Professor Mitchell from the University of Chicago, who... Uh, <laughs> Early on, uh, back in 89, wrote a lot of defense of uh, Spike Lee's film, Do the Right Thing. Uh, next to him is Octavia Hudson, who's a television producer. Octavia. <laughs> writer and director, and she has a PhD from Harvard University in education and clinical uh, psychology and practice. And next to her is Carrie Mae Weems. She's an artist. She's an artist of international reputation, and her principal medium is photography. 
she has confronted the use and meaning of stereotypes in American society. Now, Spike, last night when they had the screening of the film, when the film came to the end, I was expecting people to applaud because they were moved in some way, you know, like they do after this something that stirs them up. When the film ended, there was silence. And the other thing that I could hear was sobs in the audience. People were young, people were crying. And reading reviews of, uh, of Bamboozle, they refer to it as uh, satire about stereotypes. And I felt that was like a very weak description of what this film is all about. I wonder, Professor Mitchell, what, what do you think about what Bamboozle was trying to accomplish where it was going and if it was a, effective in getting there? <clears throat> well, I think it's very effective. Uh, at the same time, I'm not sure where it's going uh, or what uh, message, if any, it has. In some ways, I think that's not what uh, Spike Lee's films are about. I don't find them uh, films that have uh, some determinate message, political or moral. I think they set up incredibly vivid, uh, complex situations that reflect all the contradictions of, uh, of human life and especially life between and among the races in this country. So certainly it's a satire on stereotypes, but it's so much more than that to me. It's, uh, it's also a tragedy about stereotypes Stanley, and about the way stereotypes come alive and take over. Stan. Well, I think that the, uh, I think we always have to look at black American as uh, a metaphor for the United States at large, as Richard Wright said. He said, the Negro is America's metaphor. And I think that if we look at something like Bamboozle closely, we can realize that everybody has experienced Bamboozle. I mean, uh, the, you know, the, the dumb, floozy female who was often depicted in American movies, that's the female version of blackface. That's the coon version of the female. Uh, the dumb Irishman, the dumb drunken Irishman, that's the Irish version. The uh, Italian who's always eating pasta and shooting people, that's, that's the Italian version of the menstrual show. See, what makes Bamboozled important is that it speaks to the problem that all Americans have of coming out from under something that somebody else says you are. The, I, the grand, see, but, but the great tragedy and complexity of, of, of minstrelsy is this, that when the Negro got in, and minstrelsy was on the way out. When the Negro came into minstrelsy, it was on the way out. But these black people were such good singers, so funny, and sang so well that they reinvigorated minstrelsy. So in an ironic way, since that was the only entree they had in the show business, they actually strengthened the bars of the stereotype behind which they stood in American society. And so I think that the, see, where, where I thought Spike was extremely courageous was that he actually let some of those routines be funny. See, had he chosen to be corny and say, well, I don't like it at all, so I'm gonna just make it be, all be corny. Mm -hmm. See, because he actually, you actually have to laugh at some of that. <laughs> so see, when you laugh, you see what minstrelsy with black people really was. That is, that it's this horrific form in which you are dehumanized and that you also become charismatic inside your own dehumanizing stereotype. And that's the grand complexity of the minstrel proposition. That's like if you take, in other words, if you take Rita Hayworth, uh, Marilyn Monroe, Ava Gardner, anybody who has to play sexy girl, right? If she's, system, if, she's, if she's sufficiently charismatic, she actually intensifies the stereotype that imprisons her. And see, I thought that what made the movie profound was, although I have reservations, <laughs> but I have reservations about my own last book, so what can you say? <laughs> but, but, but I think what made the movie profound was this. It raised a kind of a question that is not normally raised in today's discourse because in today's world, everything is supposed to be okay, right? 
he actually asked this question. He says, if you denigrate, if you choose to denigrate a group of people, that's a moral decision. If you choose to make your living through a form of denigration, that too is a moral decision. The only failure that I thought the movie really made was that it didn't make it very clear that the menstrual update of today is the worst version of the rap video. Now there's a video up early in the movie about the bomb. But my feeling is that when you look at Lil' Kim and those people out there who give the impression that young black people are drunkards, dope smokers, or anarchistic, money grubbing, prostitutes, etc., and you put that out there as like that's the real but, black, uh, don't wait a minute, let me finish. Wait, wait, okay. That all I'm saying is, all I'm saying is this. <laughs> My brain, I told Spike this before, he said the first time he heard it. <laughs> I felt that say had he put when he was when he put that montage at the end of all those if he'd have put one of those one of those videos with those women with their booties up in the camera <laughs> and those guys with them gold teeth, them chains, <clears throat> and blah, if he'd have put that in there. And 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 if after that, we'd have had Saving Glover going, I think people would have known a little bit more about what the menstrual seal of today is. <laughs> 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 Maybe we should just go sit out in the audience. Stanley, there was, there's no artist today that allowed their likeness or their music to be included in that final montage, so that's why we try to take care of that with the two commercials, the bomb, Timmy Hill nigger, mm -hmm. <laughs> and also somewhat with the Mau Mau's, yeah. but there was no way that it would have, that no artist, no record company would have licensed their music nor their image for that. They would oh, no, I don't mean that. I mean like in Fear of a Black Hat, where they just, where in Fear of a Fear of a Black Hat was a, which is a classic. But, but Stanley. No, wait, 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 all they did in Fear of a Black Hat was they did imitation versions of that. I know, but how can I put an imitation version in that final montage? That final montage, Stanley, everything that's what makes the final montage powerful. I didn't make nothing up. Yeah. If I if I'd have stuck something there that I shot, that'd weaken it. That this way, hey. Yeah. I, didn't, I didn't tell Judy Garland and Mickey Rooney to do all that stuff. <laughs> I didn't do none of that. Yeah. All now, that stuff now, is now in the, already. in the movie, uh, Pierre Delacroix argues that he's putting out these stereotypes in order to neutralize the stereotypes. Now, I've heard that over and over again by black performers and artists. Mm -hmm. Carrie, what do you think about that? Can you neutralize stereotypes by portraying stereotypes? And um, what do you, <clears throat> I you know, know this you. is this is um, this is a very I think very complicated, very complicated, weird, twisted subject, and um, um, and, and and before I go any, any further, I have to I have to uh, um, say thank you to, to Spike for um, the tremendous work that that he's done, um, and for the vision, the particular vision that he has in relationship to. I think um, social dynamics and social problems. And I think that one of the ways in which the, the, the work is so important is that it is insistence upon looking, there's never a moment in this film, never a moment when you are at rest as audience. As audience, you are endlessly engaged in looking at this material over and over and over and over. There is no room, there is no air, this is it. Right, it is flat and in your face, you know? There's something about the way that that works, works cinematically that I would love to be able to talk to Spike about at some point. But there's something really fabulous about this incredible layering of material um, um, and the way in which this material works. Can you neutralize stereotypes? I don't know, and I'm not sure that you can. I'm not sure that you can. In fact, I think that stereotypes are, are very, very useful, and that we use, each and every one of us, 
use its stereotypes every single day to negotiate and to define our lives, right? Stereotypes are essentially socially sanctioned and agreed upon ways in which we view other people, right? Sometimes we do that as individual, sometimes we do saying. that as group, yeah. Yeah. right? But I think that that is a very important idea. So, you know, I, I saw Maya Angelou do something um, a few years ago that I thought was really, really brilliant. <clears throat> She came out on stage, she was doing this fabulous lecture at San Diego, you see San Diego. She came out on stage and she shuffled across stage. It took her like five minutes to get to the podium. And the whole way going over, she was scratching her head, grinning and smiling, and people in the audience were just, right? And when she finally got to the podium, she looked at the audience and she said, y'all don't like that, huh? Right, and the audience said, no. She said, I'm gonna tell you something. A whole bunch of you wouldn't be sitting here right now if somebody didn't do that for you. If somebody didn't do that for you, and I think that it in some ways goes back to what Stanley was saying. We um, become complicit in our own victim victimization we use stereotypes, we use the fabrication of stereotypes, the, the fabrication of image, in order to do a number of subversive is, is that, activities that and sometimes okay? simply okay? slide into it. Become complicit. I'm not what sure if it's it? a matter of whether or not it's okay. okay. Yeah. I think it's a matter of whether or not it's real. Yeah. If it's, it's, is, it, is it real, do people do it? And why do they do it, right? So that, you know, there's something, again, you know, the, the, the word stereotype in, in some ways I think is a misnomer in a way, you know, that we've, we've used it, we've, you, we, the word is so overused that it's lost its power. It's lost its real meaning. It's lost its real significance, you know, because under it is something that's much more, much more important. Stereotypes are, again, you know, there, there are ways in which one group of people can look at or process another group of people. Can process, can... But, um, but suppose can, a stereotype destroys you psychologically um, and but, physically. But, but I just have to say this, this, this thing. The, the, the I think that there's the thing the that's really important about stereotypes is that they can be actualized, that they can be brought to the real, right? So that, for instance, right, we say that there's these socially sanctioned actions, right? There's a joke that says, what are the three things you can't give a black person? A black eye, a fat lip, or a job, right? Mm -hmm. Ideas about beauty, mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? Mirror says, no white, you black bitch, and don't you forget it, <laughs> right? <laughs> the boy turns to, right? You know, when asked what he wants to be when he grows up, the little boy turns to the white man and he says, I want to be a white man because my mama said nigga ain't shit. So we're like rolling in, a, we're rolling in a very complex world and it's not a matter of whether it's right or it's wrong, but it's rather how we negotiate a very complicated but it's, life. But it's degrading. Octavia, what, what, do, you, what do you think? <clears throat> Well, I guess I'm the... Um, Particularly like, since you're working in television and, you know, the whole whole problem with uh, well, what I, they buy, what they want. I think it. that when you talk about um, Spike's film or anybody else's film, my interest has more to do with um, what it provokes. And uh, the message for me, and I guess I'm as much a victim of selective perception as anybody else, the message was very much about how we become enslaved by the trappings of our success. And to me, that was true of many of the characters in the film. And for me, what's important about Spike Lee's work in terms of my own bias is that he can fill a room like this. It's not just deconstructing what's in that film, but what he provokes for the here and now and what we do with that. I mean, I was also moved, as you were, by the number of young people who were crying when they came out of the, the film yesterday. 
And I think that's really important for us when we talk about stereotypes and we move it to not just kind of social analysis, but social action, because I think it's very important not to just look at a piece of work for what it is now. I think film, television, all of this can be catalysts for social action if you have an understanding of how it relates to you and what you need to do. I mean, the tears that I saw, I mean, I, I don't understand always how some people... Why, why do you think they were crying? I think that some people internalize stereotypes much more than other people do. And I think it's critical for us to do the kind of analysis, the self-analysis, and then translate that into how we behave in terms of the bigger message, was that, which, which, which for me was, what do we do when we are confronted by power that is beyond what our good intentions may be at the beginning? I mean, Delacroix had his um, ambitions about what he thought he was going to do. Um, as I think many writers who go to Hollywood or television have their ambitions about what they're going to do. But the issue becomes, what do they do when they're confronted with folks who say you will only be successful if you do it that way? Well, well what, what, what about that? I mean, Step and Fetch had said when, when people said he was a, a stereotype and a, a Tom and all kinds of things. Step and Fetch, you know what I'm talking about. Right. He got very upset. He said he was in a stereotype, and he never, he never degraded a black folk, and he felt he had opened, was a pioneer, and opened the movies to, to blacks to get into the movies. Well, that's what I mean about selective perception. In his mind, he wasn't telling a lie. I mean, and in, in many ways... Um, but you, you hear people say that yeah, but, today? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Stan? Yeah, but see, but, but there's a movie with Stephen Fetch in it. It's a black movie, and he does the same routine. And he's funny, too. Yeah. Because, see, when he's not playing that against white people, he's just a comic character. See, the problem of, see, all comedy is the same. Mm -hmm. I mean, comedy plays on dumb people, pretentious people, gullible people, et cetera. I mean, you, the white people that put together minstrelsy did not invent comic figures. Those comic figures invent, exist in all comedy in Africa, China, everywhere. The only question becomes whether or not the entire group is, is defined in terms of the limitations of the comic image. See, in the early 60s, I was talking to some Caucasians about, uh, <laughs> and they, were, they wanted to know why the NAACP was so upset about, about Amos and Andy, which, of course, everybody in my neighborhood hated the NAACP for getting Amos and Andy taken off TV, but that's another story. Uh, <laughs> I, just, I just said that, you know, it's a very simple thing. If, if Hollywood decided that all white guys were going to be depicted as Laurel and Hardy, as Abbott and Costello, Right, the uh, Three as the Marx Brothers say, Three Stooges. Three Stooges, if those were white guys, I said, then white people would be upset. You know, it's not a question of, if, if, if someone says that's a comic version of you and then there's all of these other versions, okay, the problem that, that uh, right. black people had in, in mass media was that the comic image was the only image. And I think that, but you see, there's another reality about show business too that Spike got to, which is this. Uh, I talked to a guy about 80 years ago, 80 years old, about 10 years ago, and he was telling me that when he was a kid, he went on the road with uh, Bill Robinson and, uh, and Bert Williams. And he said that was the top of the line traveling in show business if you were black at that time. You got to do the best trains, the best hotels, the best everything. Now, Step and Fetch it told another older black guy that I know that, that he got his his character, not from anything from some white people, but he was on a, he was coming to do an audition, and there was this cat, literal a cat, who came to, <laughs> guy came on the set and got on one of the props, and they kept trying to shoot the cat off. They said, get, get off, get off, get off. The cats were going, meow, 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 but it didn't move. So Step and Fetch it said, I'm gonna do that, right? And if you look at him and things like Steamboat Around the Bend with Will <laughs> Rogers, he never does anything. Bill Rogers will come in and say, Steven, say, yeah, yeah. Say, would you do so-and-so? I'll do it. He never does anything. He never does anything. In most of Stephen Fetch's movies, he never gets the job done. They'll say, go do that. He'll say, I'm going to do it. And then they'll come back and say, have you done it? He said, I'm, I'm on the way to doing it, boss. I said, 
They'll come back a third time. When are you going to get it done? I'm almost there. I'm almost there. Now, we know from See. Frederick Douglass that there were many slaves who did that. You like that point, that, like the one in, that, in, the, the in his autobiography, the one who takes the, takes the cow and beats the cow until the cow tries to jump over the fence and breaks his leg and then has to be shot. Mm -hmm. And then when his master says, well, boy, what's wrong with you? You know a cow can't jump. Boss, I've seen your horses jump. I thought cows could jump too. So there's a whole other side right, from, right. from Step and Fetch's perspective. But see, where, what Spike got to was this. When you get up in that, in that star echelon, which is, what's, which is what he does so well with the character of Savior, that Savior Glover plays, Man Ray, Man Tan, is that once this guy gets into it, that's all that's going on in the world. Once he's the choreographer, nobody's telling him what steps to do. Once he controls that, and he begins to become entranced by his own freedom to do something more than be out in front of a building dancing, for, for nickels and dimes, quarters, dollars, whatever people give him, then that, the whole rest of the world ceases to exist. See, the central problem with stereotyping by, by, by race or by class or by ethnicity or religion is that the person who becomes successful has no idea because he or she tends to live in another universe that the rest of the group is suffering the stereotype that's imposed upon them by what but you the do. The mov movie, uh, I think Spike was saying, that's no longer acceptable. Oh, I wasn't but, saying he no, wasn't no, saying no, it was I'm, acceptable. I'm, I think that's one of the points of right. the movie, that if it was acceptable in the past for people to take these roles because they needed the money or they needed that, that we're no longer in that position. Yeah, but look so at the we Tonight have to Show, be and take what they... But you bought. got porch monkeys on the Tonight Show. They're going to be on tonight in a couple of hours. <laughs> that is, whenever Jay Leno... Now, these are some of the best black musicians in the country, man. Whenever Jay Leno tells one of those corny jokes, you hear... <laughs> 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 I used to wonder what that was, right? First, mm -hmm. it was just nice Kevin Eubanks. They gave him a mic. Now they all got a mic. <laughs> so whenever Jay Leno goes, ha <laughs> Then they go, <laughs> <laughs> now, this is 2000. These guys can play. Right. Why do all of them have a microphone and they have to be a flesh and blood black laugh track for him? Because bamboozled is true. It's still going on. What should we do about it? Well, <laughs> we should call them out. I mean. We ain't gonna be able to pay them I, I, more than I, Jay Leno's paying them now. In the movie, Mantan, Mantan was killed. Yeah, but, you know. Inconvenient. I wanna, I wanna, I wanna piggyback on what, what Stanley's been talking about. Before I did this film, anytime people brought up Step and Fetch at Bill Robinson, Willie Best, Hattie McDaniel, Butterfly McQueen, I automatically thought of them as Uncle Tom's sellouts. And all you doing the process of the film, I've come to great understand that. For these people at that time, they had little or no choices. This is what they had to do. And so, I mean, the famous statement by Hattie McDaniel after she won the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress for Gone with Big Win, she says, better to play a maid than be a maid. At the same time, I was more understanding, more lean with them. It really made me harsher with African Americans today, athletes and entertainers today, because we have a lot more choice. If somebody doesn't take a job today, they're not going to be cleaning somebody's house. Mm -hmm. I mean, so. Mm -hmm. But there's like no way in which you like see, rarely see a broad life that's played by. Um, African Americans, whether we're looking at TV, film, or in any other sort of category. I mean, they, are all, they all seem to be, for the most part, these flattened out characters, so that even though there is this idea that there is more choice, the choices still seem to be, in terms of the um, overall imagery, the ways in which black people are projected or pre represented, is still fairly one-dimensional. One mm -hmm. Spike, you know? uh, if, if uh, the young people are very moved by this uh, film, deeply moved by it, and obviously con concerned about what's going on, if you had to tell them, uh, what, like, what can they do? What can they do 
I mean, should they mobilize, organize? Yeah. What, 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 I mean, well, as I, you, as you, what did you want this film? Well, I just want people to, to think about this, this stuff they see. And so I don't, I don't, I don't think a lot of people, young, especially young people, understand the power they have because, you know, it's a matter of not watching a television show or not going to a movie or not buying a, a, a CD because you might use like. It might have been some images in that video that you like. Everybody now has an email address, mm -hmm. you know. So those are things to, you know, to consider. And also, there might be a lot of people in the audience who, who might want to go in this industry, who right. might want to write or direct or act. And, and I think that it's not really even a, a, a race question because everyone, no matter what your field you've been, you're going to be, be, be put in a position where you might have to be asked to compromise your beliefs in or right. something yeah, for you to get ahead. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, so it has nothing even to do with being an actor. It just might, if you're in med school, law school, or, you know, anything else. So these are all things that you're going to have to, to face. And, and you really only person that can decide, is it worth, should I do it? So, well, you know, well, you know, okay, stand, that Gina, stand Gina, one minute, stand. But no, Gina, Gina, no, Gina, no, Gina Davis said I, something very important to what he said. When she was making Thelma and Louise, right, uh, there was a scene where she was supposed to take her top off, right, that had nothing to do with the movie. It had to do with the director. And Susan Sarandon stepped in there and she said, no, Gina is not taking her top off. Right. And then it suddenly hit Gina Davis that, oh, I don't have to take my top off for no reason, right? And so all I'm just saying is, so in, in terms of what Spike is saying, that's what he means, is that here you've got two respectable white actresses, right? One of them, the director says, you are going to put those things out here in front of my camera. And another one just says, no, you're not. And then suddenly it hits her. That's what I meant about that's the female version of Tommy. That's the coon show for the female. That's the female blackface. When there's no reason to do it, somebody just decides you're going to be this, in, this image that has nothing to do with your character. Well, what has, Spike is saying is absolutely true. Everybody right, right. has okay. got to deal okay. with the same thing. This is not so just a the, race in, problem. In the new millennium, none of us have to be minstrels unless we choose, decide, to. choose to be. That's right. But is that, okay. but then, but is that the question that they lie is facing? Thank, I want to thank the panel. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> but the students have been here since like 3.30. Yeah, but they They've been, no, they've been okay. here since September. <laughs> uh, I'll yield to, to the director. We gonna say, um, um, I understand what Stan Stanley is saying, but the thing that's really interesting about the ways in which um, subjects get used, minority subjects get used, and I include like women within that, is that you know that that you present your breast because it's important to it's important for the audience to realize that you are an, are an object of desire. Right, that that is the important role that taking your shirt off implies. That's why it's done to the same extent that you know a black actor is asked to, to, to play some weird role because it reinforces an idea about the relationship of the white subject, of the white viewer in relationship to the white subject or, or the, the, black, the black object which I think is a very, very important thing, that there are ways in which we look to have I, our, our ideas about a group of people solidify through the actions that they will act out for us so that they represent for us an ongoing uh, melange in our own little matrix thinking about, you know, what is Asia to me? What is black to me? What is Africa to me? What is Puerto Rican to me? What is woman to me? What is man to me? Right? All of those, I think, are, you know, that, that, that you know that we use the, these plays to reinforce certain ideas uh, and therefore maintain our relationship of power in relationship and, and, to that subject. Okay. But the, but the thing that I wanted to ask Spike about has to, to do with this thing that um, that Stanley also mentioned 
in the film, um, um, Savan doesn't have a, a choice, and Delacroix doesn't have a choice. That in fact they're constructed as two people that really don't have choice. No, no, no. Yeah, I no. think so. That, that's what I'm going to put out there. That they, you know, if, and, and what is their choice? What is their choice? Yes, that, they were, they were, that they were positioned in a certain way so that they were brought into a certain kind of dynamic that made it impossible for okay. them to move like you answer that, in we're go to a clear way. I think they have choices. I think that where Delacroix had gotten, where he got in trouble is that it was his pride. Because he could have quit. He could have quit, just walked away. But number one, he had this big loft in, in the clock tower in Dumbo down on the Brooklyn Bridge. And so he wanted, he tried to concoct a plan where he can get fired and still get his money. Because if he quit, he couldn't get any money. But if he, but if he got fired, he would still get his, his right, thing. Right. Also, Savion Glover, he was given hints all along. I mean, Jay's character was talking to him. Tommy was talking to him. And he just got seduced by the bling bling, you know. He, he, he got seduced. So, so they, had, they had a choice. I mean, but it's a hard choice. If you're on the streets, first of all, mm -hmm. they're living in, a, in a, a, tenement. a tenement illegally. Then Giuliani's people come in, kick them out. <laughs> So, so they're on. So they're on the street, and so if someone gives you, if you're homeless, dancing with pennies on the street, and someone gives you opportunity, possibly be in a TV show. Mm -hmm. Most people I know are gonna take the job, get off the street, and try to get along, but. I think in the film, I think if you if you look at the film again, everybody has a point where they can get out. Various times throughout the film, there are times where you can get out, but people don't do it. You can so get out. We're going to the students. Well, let's give a hand to the panel first, everyone. There's, there's four microphones. Uh, two down here and two upstairs. When you come to the microphone, say your name, ident just identify yourself, and go quick to a brief question, okay, of the panel or a specific member of the panel. Over here. My name is Christina Lewis. I'm a junior at the college. And this is a question that ties into the idea of success. And you've been talking about how, um, how actors and entertainers can use stereotypes to become very personally successful. But I'd like to ask you what you think, if it's possible that actors and entertainers can use stereotypes to not only become personally successful, but to eventually become a benefit to, you know, to their race or to their, you know, to entertaining in general. And I have two people in mind, Chris Tucker, and I'm thinking of a New York Times Magazine article on him that mentioned that he was the first black actor to um, have a $20 million fee and to draw people from Europe, which some people would consider a positive thing, and someone like Madonna, who, through using you know, sexual imagery and objectifying herself as a sexual object, has become a very powerful woman in entertainment. Stan, you want to take a crack? We. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, well, I'll say this. Without Madonna, who, who material girl, essentially was embraced by certain feminists as a feminist statement because she was asserting a kind of prostitutional attitude without a pimp. I think that, uh, <laughs> I think that without her, you would not have Lil' Kim, and I think we could do without both of them. <laughs> uh, secondarily, the, see, here, see, here, see, here's the thing. See, what, see, it doesn't matter whether you take the stereotype over or the stereotype is handed to you. If you bring, that's what I meant earlier, if you bring charismatic fire to the demeaning version of, of your group, to the extent that your group's individuality is melted down into this, into this cage, the fact that you become powerful, see to me, like that's the worst commentary on, 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 uh, on crass materialism. Well, it wasn't shit, but he made $20 million for it. You know what I mean? I mean, and Chris Tucker, I mean, have you ever seen him talk outside of a, 
<laughs> like on Larry King? No. Chris Tucker, I mean, he needs to stay up on the stage. The thing is, he's not, and, and what he was, and the things he talks about, plus rush hour. Oh. I thought rush hour, I mean, I, see, when I looked at rush hour, I said, now, this is enough, this is the level of time, and I was not prepared to see. <laughs> I mean, I, I didn't know that that's what that was gonna be. I was, I, I got trapped in a, in a bus going down to Washington because the planes couldn't go out of, out of LaGuardia, and we had to look at that. <laughs> and when we got to a stop, this, this young black woman on the bus, she came with me, she said, I sure am glad I'm not a black man. <laughs> I said, <laughs> Okay. So I said, and, and, and what I mean is that, see, there's, oh, believe me, there's always a place for a black person who's going to be Tommen and Jeffin, whatever, whatever the version is. There's always a job for you to do that. There's always a job for a woman to roll her booty at the camera. There's always a, those kinds of jobs. They're always there. You will never, ever go to a studio and they say, well, I want a Tom. They say, we don't have any parts for you today. I want to play a hoe. We don't have any hoe roles. <laughs> no, no, don't worry. No. But her question is also. So, see, the, see, the, see, finally, the biggest question in America is this, is can we achieve the idea that everybody has a specific background, but everybody is a mysterious individual whom we do not know until he or she arrives? Thank you, If Stan. we can ever get to that, we'll be all right. Thank you, Stan. Let's okay. go over here for second question. Good evening, my name is Brother R.A. and I just want to say, okay. Okay. Spike, you deserve realblacktalk.com two fist up for bamboozle. In the 60s, it was one fist. The, year, the new millennium, we have What's two fists question, up. Brother? The question is, <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Poussin, I want to appreciate your opening the, comment the making third? the statement <laughs> a recovering minstrel or a recovering from bamboozle. We are all bamboozled. We as black people in the 21st question, century, question, question. I just want to say that we yeah. are suffering from transatlantic slavery syndrome. Oh. And now, Spike, for you, your next movie, will it be along the same lines? And also, Spike, I heard that you are hired by some network. Do you have any ideas of what the scripts will be coming down the pike? Uh, to answer that question, uh, we just signed a deal with USA Network, so it's going to be no sitcoms. Yay! Like, uh, <laughs> Hour-long, episodic type of stuff. And next film, the next script I'm working on, we don't have the finance, it's going to be a uh, film about Joe Lewis and Max Schmeling. So it'll be epic. And what happened to Jackie Robinson? Don't have the money for that yet. So I'm writing that with uh, Bert Sugar and, and Bud Schilberg. I'm gonna write that together. I can't see the mics up there. There's mics over here. Person at the... Where are the mics? Up there? I'm here. Okay, <laughs> right there. Thank you, uh, brown and non-brown people for uh, holding this forum. My name's Tony B. And what I have to ask is, how do we get to see Bamboozled at several, many other theaters? We know the people, the people who uh, distribute this information, movies and such, don't look like me or you. So how do you cope with that challenge, Mr. Lee? Well, number one, People have to, to get in the car and go to where the movie is playing. <laughs> None of this, well, it's not my neighborhood. But, this but is, is not, there it's, anything they can do? No, there's nothing they can do. To make the there's theater. There's nothing they can do. Make it, yeah, well, there's nothing they can do. Why? Because. Can't they make the theater? They can't make them do anything. They, they got to only have. Only, no, it doesn't work like that. Protest. How many Protest. people in here went to the see the, the movie? But they went to oh. preview. You can't, you mean you, in no activist yeah. way, if you came after these people, you couldn't make them show that film more in different it, cities it and places. It doesn't work like that. Uh, First of all, this is not a film where, where it's a wide release. Wide release is like a thousand or more theaters. Mm. We've had, at the most, at the highest total, we've 250. So, 
so often I hear us complain about. But how do they make that, how, do, how is that decision made? That decision, based on what? That decision is made by looking at the markets. They look at where your films have done well in the past. Then they see how much money they have to spend. And for so often, we, I hear this all the time, you know, we talk about blame the studios. Well, it wasn't in my, my, it wasn't in my neighborhood. That, that's not gonna make it. I mean, this. I mean, you go to Beloved and, and uh, a whole bunch of African American films, and I'm not talking about the scary movie and stuff like that. <laughs> Where we don't put in the extra effort. If you know that this film is playing in one theater and it's getting an art house release, then you have to travel to go where that film is is playing. It's just as simple as that. Or you, if you don't go, the next time you're going to see it's going to be video. But if, 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 this, if this film, let's say everybody went to the theaters and was doing very well, would that make them then give a wider release to the film? If it was, if it was yeah, clearly I mean, very but popular? If they, if they saw that every show was being sold out in Boston, I think they would have saw the need to, to get more theaters. So if you go to see, if you keep packing the theaters in Boston, maybe they'll put in some other theaters in Boston? That's what I ain't doing. I think we'll be on that point now. But, uh, <laughs> but that's okay, great. anyway, it's, it's, it's tough. Where's the other mic up there? Right here. All right, Adam Taylor, Kennedy School of Government. I agree that it's really critical that we challenge artists in terms of what they're promoting and perpetuating, and consumers as well. But I think we're letting the industry off the hook a little bit. And maybe I'm not hearing that enough from you. But to me, the industry is full of institutionalized racism. And I want to know what you prescribe to do to dismantle that racism. And in one of the solutions that Spike proposed, I didn't think he proposed it strong enough, is the power of the consumer, the power of the almighty dollar to influence the actual industry and the decisions that are made. I know it's not that easy, but I want to hear what you think needs to happen to dismantle racism in the entertainment industry. Me? <laughs> By a studio. Mm -mm. What I think is that as, we, as we're in this new millennium, it's not, it's, it's, for me, it's not a big thing that we have black actors making $20 million a movie, like Will, Denzel, Eddie, Mark Lawrence, and Chris Tucker. And except for Denzel, most of those guys are basically comedians. For me, the, the move we have to make is on the gatekeepers. And by the gatekeepers, I mean these are the people that decide what movies get made, what movies don't get made. What te what's on your television show, what doesn't get on. What goes on the front page of your paper, and what gets buried on page 80. These, these are positions that we have to move on because no matter how stupid you might think that Homeboy's Mind of Space was, or The Secret Diary of Desmond Pfeiffer, which was a sitcom about a Holocaust, even dumber was the person at UPenn that decided that this could go on the air. So we really have to put pressure and try to exert whatever power we can on those final, who are these people that, that make these decisions? Octavia, you want to say a few words? Well, I, I think it relates um, first to the, the first question that the young lady did, too. I, I, I believe very strongly that um, environments tend to change individuals more than individuals change environments. It doesn't mean that you can't make change, but it means that you have to be very clear on what it is you're trying to do and not assume that you are so superior and so knowledgeable that you won't get caught up in what that system may be. And in answer to your question about um, consumers, I think it's very important. It's particularly true of television. But again, you have to have that clarity of what you're doing. I mean, I'm working on a project that I call top down and bottoms up, you do have to deal with gatekeepers, but you are much stronger dealing with gatekeepers when you are, have a constituency of many consumers than you are by yourself talking about what's right and wrong when people have probably had that skewed because they, you know, gave up that 
clear vision in order to get that success. And so you do have to have, um, do that extra work of organizing in communities, and that's difficult work, and that's work that not everybody wants to go do. But I do think that the solution does involve consumers and having some clarity about what you want and what you're willing to do to get it. Thank you. Uh, question over there. Good evening, Mr. Lee. This question is for you. My name is Lisa Brightman, and I first want to commend you for all your inspirational work and addressing social issues. But I was wondering, um, who has been your inspiration and why? And as a totally blind woman, I was wondering, is Bamboozle Audio described? I don't know about it. I've never heard of Audio Described. What is that? Well, it's where they narrate um, images on the screen verbally so that blind people can also um, enjoy the movie. I don't think so because I've never heard that before, but I'm going to make sure that uh, I, I got to make a call. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. My, my inspiration has really come from my parents and, and grandparents, and people have asked me where the, the genesis for, for Bamboozle. And it really came when I was like seven, eight years old. I forgot the exact date when I was watching a Tarzan movie, and my mother came in and turned the TV off. And she explained to me why I could not watch any more Tarzan films. And she, she sat, I mean, she just didn't yell and scream. She sat down and explained to me why I could not watch this film. And then on top of that, her final was like a lecture. The last thing she said was, and Cleopatra looked like Elizabeth Taylor either. <laughs> so from that moment on, that's when I began to, uh, I was seven, eight years old, I had to think about images that I was seeing in films, not just films, TV, magazines, everything, newspapers. Oh, thank you. Question over here. Hi, my name is Shankar Swami. I'm a junior at the college. Uh, thank you all for coming. I really enjoyed the panel. Even though I was a Mets fan, some of Spike's comments deeply wounded me. Um, <laughs> but that's okay. Um, my question is about difficulty of portraying a positive yet also realistic uh, por portrayal of black America, and I, I guess to clarify, a movie like Menace to Society, which I thought was a very powerful movie in its portrayal of the urban plight of black Americans, also to the uncareful observer, he might walk away saying, oh, well, black Americans are violent and they're in gangs and they have problems with drugs and that's it. Um, how, how difficult is it to sort of tightrope this, this balancing line between portraying a realistic uh, representation of the struggles that black Americans face, which aren't necessarily their fault, but are built up over years of discrimination, and also trying to portray a positive, strong image of black America. Well, from the... I know you want to... No, no, you go ahead, you go ahead. Well, go ahead. Sure. Oh. From the very beginning, from the very beginning, I was never really... My goal was never set out just to do... My, I have to do positive images of black people. I was really trying to be more realistic. And you come under fire for that. The same reason, you know, Toni Morrison gets killed, too, for that same thing. Like, you know, how could you have a, a, a black grandmother setting her grandchild fire or, or this 15-year-old this kid still being, you know, nursed, you know? But I don't worry about that stuff. I mean, for me, I mean, if that's the case, and you just, you, it's a... It's like a straitjacket if all, if, if every time out, all, you can't have anything 100% angelic and godlike. And they're, they're just can't, it's not dramatic, number one. And, and it's not realistic. So, I mean, that's, on school days, we were killed because, you know, we were showing, how could you sell this dirty laundry? Like, we, we do this stuff by color or class and, and you know. But, didn't worry about it. Show and you, the and you really can't, unless then you really just, if you, everything you do, you say, well, if somebody sees this, what are they going to think? Right. Are they going to think that about the whole race? Then you can't work. Then, then you're, you'll be put in a coma. You're paralyzed. Well, you know, uh, and quick response. Well, you know, I, uh, 
Isaac Singer. Well, you know, Isaac, I, Isaac Singer said that once he was uh, approached by Jews who asked him why he was writing these stories about uh, thieves and prostitutes and hustlers and why he wasn't writing fiction about uh, nice Jewish lawyers and nice Jewish dentists and nice Jewish doctors. And he said, because nice Jewish lawyers, nice Jewish dentists, and nice Jewish doctors are boring. <laughs> and he said he also felt that he would be underlining anti-Semitism if he felt required to deny the, the complexity of Jews in order to try to avoid being stereotyped. I think that as long as a group of people has to be defined by every single movie or every single book, the, the group is in trouble. I mean, if the fact of the matter is, if you go to Compton, or if you went there at the time that Minister Society was made, those Negroes were exactly like they were when I was growing up in L.A. I knew every one of those guys that was in that movie. I just was, they didn't have, they didn't braid their hair then. But, the, but those people I can see were why. exactly like they, they were exactly that way 40 years ago. They're exactly like that now, that group of people. But, but, but there was the Jada Pinkett character who is the dominant figure in most of those communities who's trying to do something else. I mean, at the worst points of crime in black communities, 90% of the people aren't out there doing that. Right. So that's, ne I mean, that's, that, that's always a minority, so it's never, you know. Right. Over here, Mike up there. Uh, my name is Manuel Chavez. I'm a student here at Deccan School. I'm a foreigner, I'm Mexican. Uh, I would like to know what you think about political correctness, because it seems to me that uh, Sometimes it uh, frapped racism in words that it actually reinforced any kind of prejudice or any kind of power relationship that is, that, that belongs or, or that somehow belongs to these words. Uh, sometimes I think it's better to leave language to recreate itself. I don't know what to think about it. Um. Um, what was the last part of what you said? Sometimes you think that it's better to leave language to? Recreate itself to recreate itself. So that, so are you saying that perhaps that by, um, by pulling out this language, by bringing it forth, that, it, that in fact you're reinforcing it? No, 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 yeah, I think that banning this language to actually reinforce all the prejudice and power relationships and stereotypes yeah. that are embedded in these words. Right. I think it's, it, I think that uh, I understand, but I think that it's more more complicated than that. And I do think that we have like a an obligation, a moral obligation, a social obligation, a political ops of, you know obligation to underscore the complexities of the of the life in which we in which we live, and uh, and to and to be able to name it. I mean, one of the things that I think is so problematic about the time in which we're living, you know, if we talk about racism, if we talk about sexism, if we talk about Feminism, then the assumption is, is that at this point we're simply operating, you know, as a, a, you know, with words that are social irritants, and therefore we need to not use them anymore. That we need a new language to describe the problem. But I think that it's much more complicated than that, and I think that it's important to insist that you point to things like racism and things like sexism, that you use the language because the language is in fact vital even though it's changing. Uh, thank you. The mic, mic up there. What happened to Stanley? Hello. Um, <laughs> my name is Frank Om. I'm a Kenny School student. Um, there are Toms and, and Aunt Jemimas in other ethnic uh, minority communities as well. For example, in the Asian American community, there are Jackie Chans and Sammo Hungs playing Kung Fu Masters. There's Lucy Liu's playing Dragon Ladies. And so the problem is that these are the only portrayals of Asian Americans, whereas, at least in the black situation, name any personality trait, and I can name you a black actor or actress or a role, right? So this is my challenge to Spike Lee. Would you be willing to direct or produce a movie that it deals with the Asian American experience? <laughs> what happened to John Woo? I know, I know. Let John Woo do it. I know you can only make a movie. Look, I know you can only make a movie from your own experience, right? But I'm not necessarily. But go ahead. Well, I don't think I don't think any other director could have produced a movie like Bamboozled. Just, it's ridiculous. 
And so I don't, I don't, for example, I can't, I don't think John Woo could have made a movie right now in, in this current times. And so I think someone with your stature and your resources can try to make, I don't know, a trilogy of <laughs> ethnic minority movies. Or, I don't know, one of Go ahead. Go ahead. No, first thing, that, that, that's absolutely incorrect. <laughs> the thing is, see, we can't, we, as Americans, we, as, as Americans, as Americans, we cannot buy into that. Americans know Americans. I'm sorry. I grew up in a community with Mexicans, Chinese, etc. My mother, we, we went in their house, they went in ours. I know something about them. You do, and you, and you can find out. I mean, if Spike decides to do a movie about black guys who worked in turpentine mills in the South in the 20s, he would have to research that. They don't, they don't do that in Brooklyn. <laughs> and, just because, and just because he's black, he's not gonna know that. If he's gonna do the movie about Joe Lewis, he's got to research that period. See, nobody in here should buy that. Don't let them tell you that because you look this way, you don't know anything about that, or you can't figure this out, et cetera. You are a human being. Exactly. And you're human. The human commonality is what art is about. But Stanley. Now, that means you, now. Stanley. Now, now, all I'm saying, Spike, I think Spike Lee right now, if he, if he were going to direct a movie with Robert De Niro and a bunch of people with an all-white cast set in a particular time in America, I think if he worked on it, he could do a good job at it. He doesn't have to be from that background. Mm. I mean, Spike is a director. He's an artist. He's not a Negro with a camera, you know? <laughs> I, I mean, first thing, the first thing is, the first, the first and last thing I have to say about it, the camera, the film, they do not know. They're not gonna say, oh, it's a black guy behind the camera and some white guys in front, I'm not working. <laughs> it's a black guy shot this scene, I'm the film, I'm not being developed. <laughs> you know, I'm on protest. That's not how that goes. I mean, I think Spike can do whatever he wants to do. He's, a, he's an extremely talented person. And I think you or anybody Asian or whatever you wanna do, do it. Don't buy this bullshit. <laughs> Don't buy it. Go Tom, out there. Tom. I would just like to second that and, and to say that I Is, think uh, we ought to encourage can you hear Spike him? Lee. Okay. We ought to encourage Spike Lee to make uh, films about white people. To me, one of the most brilliant moments in Do the Right Thing was this, the scenes involving the Korean grocer uh, across the street from Sal's famous pizzeria. Also, Sal and his sons are portrayed uh, with great sensitivity, I think. My favorite moment. And, and that film is when uh, the Korean gro grocer learns to speak for a moment uh, like the community around him, and he's, but he doesn't do it right. He says, motherfucker, you. And uh, <laughs> it, it says, and Radio Rahim says, you know, that's not a verb. That, that's, uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think, uh, I, I think Spike Lee. You write script now. <laughs> I, I think Spike Lee is all, he's already <laughs> making films about white people and uh, people of other ethnic, ethnic groups. And uh, to me, the character that made me laugh loudest in, in Bamboozled was Dumwitty. Uh, who, I felt uh, connections with him and, and characters like George Carlin and, and characters like myself. I mean, the wannabe. I think you should make a film called Wannabes. <laughs> Uh, my question uh, is... Your uh, name first, please. My name is Paul Bogan. Uh, I'm from uh, University of Lowell, graduate school. Also, I'm a Vietnam slash Persian Gulf veteran. I'm a writer and an actor. And I'd like to... Uh, I'm throwing it all out there. And I'd like to ask two questions. This question for Spike and the sister, and I know your name in the block. Um, as a writer, I've been getting criticized because I grew up in Alabama, and I write a lot about the experiences growing up in the 50s and 60s. Most of my plays are like that. That's when I grew up as a child. And I uh, produced some of them out in Lowell and some in Boston. And people ask me, well, that's all you can write about is, is people run, trying to run away from slavery. So I get slammed with that, and I'd like to get your opinion. Secondly, uh, as a writer trying to find funds throughout this country, produce stuff uh, such as a story I've written about my st struggles as a black man in Vietnam and when I came back 
from Vietnam dealing with homelessness, dealing with drug addictions. I've written stories about that because I belong to a veteran center that has over three or 400 veterans that, uh, that are all suffering from alcoholism, drug addiction, and they just threw us out on the street. I've written a play about that too. And I get slammed again by folks saying, you can't write nothing but something about somebody who's negative. You can't write anything about somebody who's positive. But I want to find out uh, from you all, number one, what should I do about that? Secondly, where is a good place to start looking for funds? <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, let me let me answer around your question in in the sense that um, one of the things that I felt uh, during the time when uh, Do the Right Thing came out, I can remember seeing an interview with Spike, and it was a very critical. And he ended the interview by saying, "Well, do your own films, okay?" Which I think is a very important issue to keep in mind. I mean, I when I talked initially about not just deconstructing films and bamboozle, but also being able to construct them to understand storytelling, understand the process. So I applaud what you're doing. But I also recognize, which is the project that I'm working on, that there's no home for people who want to do either more social good or, or socially responsible, different kinds of, of programs. So that I do think that there's a need for more of an infrastructure so there's a place for you to go with that kind of thing. And, and I don't have the answer to that. Part of what I'm doing is trying to figure out how best to do that. Because if you don't do that, then what happens is the story that you have over and over and over and over again in Hollywood, in which was what Bamboozle was about, was the part that I drew out. People come with a particular vision, and by the time people start bouncing their heads around and saying it's got to be this or got to be that, you lose your vision. And so the point that you're raising is that there needs to be an infrastructure, and I agree with you. Where the money is, I don't know. You don't know. <laughs> One last question over here. Kimberly Rogers, Harvard Graduate School of Education. My question is this for Mr. Lee. Is there a particular reason that Pierre Lacroix, your Uncle Tom Lee character, that he's a Harvard alumnus? No. <laughs> Are you trying to say that we Ouch. What we try, this is a satire, so. <laughs> It's, we chose Harvard the same reason we chose Tommy Hill. <laughs> when you're doing a satire, you go after the biggest. Tommy Hill figure, Mother Teresa, Whoopi Goldberg, Diana Ross, Cuba Gooding, Ving Rain. So it was just, uh, it just wasn't Harvard. It was like, you're, you're included amongst like 150 references to uh, <laughs> uh, you know, you're not at the mic, sister. That's it. They're gonna get you. These people are gonna get you afterwards. Uh -oh. <laughs> Go ahead, be revolutionary. <laughs> Okay, I will. What? No. Not, not, not to a, no way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, thank, thank all of you. I'm thank sure. all of you very much. Let me thank the wonderful panel. And Spike Lee here. Thank you very, very much. Yeah. Where are we having dinner, Reese?